Our scripture lesson this morning is from the Gospel of Mark. Jesus and his disciples are on the road traveling, they're healing and teaching. And this particular part of Mark's Gospel presents a number of lessons and stories about the suffering that Jesus anticipates. But in this morning's text, we find a lesson on greatness and temptation. So listen now as we read Mark chapter 9, 9, 38 through 50. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him, but because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. For it is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. For it is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell where their worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. This is the word of the Lord. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I have always been curious as to why out of all of the experiences we have in life, there are certain moments that immediately claim a permanent place in our memory. Often we know at the very moment they happen that this will always be accessible to us. Whereas the rest, or most, of our experiences are filed away so deep in our cerebral crevices that we must be very intentional and often have some clues about remembering them or else they are easily forgotten. And this morning, I'd like to share with you one of those unforgettable moments for me that occurred some years ago when I lived in Germany. I lived there for a year as part of the military community with my daughter and my grandson, Travis, and my son-in-law, who was stationed at the military installation in Schweinfurt, Germany. The Schweinfurt base was composed, actually, of two separate posts. Ledward base was the location of the PX and the health clinic and most of the administration buildings. And across the street was the con base the site for training and other dedicated functions. But both locations had a chapel, which made it possible for the Schweinfurt military community to enjoy quite a variety of worship experiences every Sunday morning. There was a Catholic mass, a contemporary service, an evening vesper service, as well as several other denominational services that were offered. My family attended worship in the chapel on Khan, which was led by the base chaplain, Reverend Mike Lemke, who was Lutheran. Therefore, the service he led was the reform service that was offered to the community. Because the reform worship was led by a Lutheran pastor, communion was offered every single week. And the first Sunday I attended this service, I had been in Germany only a few weeks. I remember it was a gorgeous fall morning. And I was still making adjustments to this new and exciting situation in which I found myself. 
We were a pretty small group of reform worshipers, less than 25 most Sundays, who gathered for this service. So after the message was preached and the communion liturgy was sung, there was always enough room for everyone in attendance to come forward and receive communion at the table. We actually stood elbow to elbow in a semicircle in front of the communion table. On that first Sunday, when we came forward for communion, I happened to be standing in a place where the communion table was directly between me and Chaplain Lemke. Reverend Lemke and his deacon began sidestepping their way around the circle, offering the bread and the wine to each of us. Finally, Mike and his deacon passed that point which, in which the communion table no longer obstructed my view. And as I saw Mike lean forward, offering the host the bread to those across the chancel from me, I was positively stunned by what I saw. And I knew instantly this was one of those moments that I would never forget. You see, as Mike leaned over, there beneath his white alb and chasuble, I saw combat boots and green fatigues. Now you're probably thinking, well, Karen, of course. What's so memorable about that? After all, he was in combat boots and fatigues because this was a military base. And Mike was a soldier as well as a pastor. Clearly, you can see I had not yet assimilated into my psyche this new community into which I had just arrived and this new context in which the Lord's Supper was being offered. At that moment, a number of things collided in my brain and in my heart. I remember thinking, this is the church being in the world, on the move, on the front lines. I was extremely moved by the fact that my church, my Christ, the sacrament that has always held so much meaning for me, was available to me here, even though I was thousands of miles from home, in a place where I could not yet speak the language, translate dollars into euros, yards into meters, nor read the road sign. In that instant, I realized how grateful the soldiers who are in foreign places and on the front lines of combat must be to receive communion no matter where it is that we send them. This experience of immense personal gratitude and deep appreciation for the church was accompanied by a moment of visceral recognition, confirmation of what we confess, that the church is present wherever the word is preached and the sacraments are rightly offered. In a foreign country, in a Lutheran service of worship, on a military base where culture and community were both so unfamiliar, I had walked right into the familiar, the manifest presence of Christ, because the church was there. But even more memorable, when I saw Mike's combat boots beneath his alb, I saw the symbols of both war and peace occupying the same space. And the memory of that site will forever be with me and will evermore challenge my very pacifistic nature. Being obedient to the vows that Mike had made to God and the vows he had made to his country, every Sunday morning, after wrapping his feet in equipment for war, Reverend Mike Lemke offered from his hands the penultimate symbol of peace, the body of Christ and the cup of salvation. Excuse me. Now, turning to our scripture reading, we hear the disciples complaining. John is complaining about someone who is healing in Jesus' name who was not part of the in-group. They think they are the only ones who have the right, the legitimate power, to perform such miracles. And they were just sure Jesus was going to agree with them. But he didn't agree with them. And what follows is a very sober warning not to cause little ones to stumble. 
As we know, little ones can be interpreted as children, or it can refer to those who are young in the faith. But regardless of the specifics intended, it clearly refers to those who have little or no power. He tells them that whatever you have that could be a stumbling block for someone, your hand, your foot, your eye, you're better off without it than to reap the consequences of causing someone to fall. Then in verse 49 and 50, Jesus mentions salt of all things. Now it took me a while to see a connection between salt and the preceding illustrations about the hand, the foot, and the eye. We know salt was extremely valuable. It's the root of the word salary. Hence the saying, he or she is or is not worth their salt. Salt was an important part of the sacrificial offerings. And salt and bread were often offered to guests as a gesture of hospitality. But it appears that hospitality was definitely not what was on the minds of Jesus' disciples, who felt someone outside their group was stepping on their territorial toes. So given what we know about salt, its properties, its value, what I think Jesus is doing here is using salt as a metaphor for power. He's teaching his disciples that their behavior, their attitude, their demeanor, how they were handling the power he had given them is extremely important to the mission to which Jesus has called and commissioned them. He's suggesting they, will be, they should be cooperative instead of competitive. Essentially, he's telling them to reduce their sense of self-importance, their sense of entitlement to being the only authorized hands of the Lord, reduce it down to a humble pinch. The exaggerated sense of self-righteousness and authority they were displaying had the same effect on the mission and ministry of Christ as too much salt in the stew. So he warns, just like a hand or a foot or an eye, if the salt, the power that they possess, could cause another to stumble because they were so full of themselves, they might find for their own good and that that power he had given them could be and should be taken away. Essentially saying, receive and use the power I have given you, but use it with great humility. What a good reminder this is for all of us. For power without humility is absolutely deadly to those who possess such power, as well as those who may stumble because of it. Power and humility. Strange bedfellows or a dynamic duo? How difficult it is in these days in which we live to imagine peace in a world that is so diverse, a world with such vast inequities of resources and abilities and power. There's little people and big people, those with no power and those with great power. The truth is there will always be an unequal distribution of power because there will always be someone, some nation, some group who is stronger or more articulate than ours. There will always be those who will possess greater negotiation skills or have a greater social status or quicker reasoning than we do. After all, if we were all equally equipped, Christ would have had little reason to speak as often as he did about how we are to strive to live together and to love one another. And how, and here in this morning's scripture, Jesus is trying to impress on these disciples just how important it is to manage the authority, the power they have been given, and subsequently just how essential it will be to cultivate humility in order that their power may not cause harm or become ineffective. How many times have we seen good people elected to public office or someone thrust into the spotlight because they did something really wonderful only to find them in the news later because they are in some kind of trouble? More often than not, this is because they were not capable of handling the power and prestige that accompanied their newly found fame. This is what Jesus is warning his followers to be aware of. 
So it appears that peace is not only about the equal and just distribution of power, but rather it appears that the true formula for peace may in fact lie in the hands of those who possess power and their willingness and ability to resist misusing the power they have. In the military, one's uniform is the primary identifying mark of each soldier's MOS, Military Occupational Specialty. In Christ's church, it is the alb, the servant's gown, the robe that is metaphorically our uniform. Just like Reverend Mike Lemke, as followers of Christ, we are expected to get up every day put on our own particular variety of combat boots, whatever that may be, in preparation for whatever awaits us outside the safe green zone of our homes. But also, as members of Christ's church, we must never forget to mentally put on the alb, the servant's gown, in anticipation of opening our hands to the world in humble service. Whatever the specific task or mission specialty we believe Christ has called each one of us to perform. We must never consider ourselves ready for action unless we have put on humility, because without putting on humility, we definitely run the risk of losing our saltiness, our power, our effectiveness, as witnesses to the truth of God's love and grace. Peace of mind, peace within our families, peace within the church, and most certainly peace within our world simply cannot become a reality until we accept the essential connection that exists between power and humility. Just imagine what might be possible if a nation, as a nation, if we would decide to shroud the global power that we possess with deep and abiding humility. If that seems a bit too much to imagine, then let's start with our own families and then with this community of faith. Let us all privately vow to serve one another and the communities in which we live with love and humility. Each and every one of us is called to suit up and show up every day, to share the healing power of grace and forgiveness, the power of reconciliation with God and with one another by being in the world like salt, a humble, Christ-like presence that has the power to make everything better. So this morning, when you come to this communion table, I offer you this image of peace. It is the image of a man dressed in the uniform of the most powerful nation on this planet, who then covers himself with the garment of a servant, and bending low, offers the symbol of everlasting peace from the palms of his open hands. Once again, verse 50. Have salt in yourselves, and be at peace with one another. Amen and amen.